and welcome to Ancient Secrets. Like a podcast, it's a Zoom cast where you get the opportunity to meet God's actual cast. I'm Rabbi Flip of Congregation Micah, coming to you from Nashville, Tennessee, and I'm here to introduce you to the theological heroes of our past so that we might glean some practical wisdom for the present. After each interview, our guests will reveal their actual identities, share a little bit about their own theology and the missions of the organizations they serve. So put on your imagination caps, get ready for some good advice to help us get through these tougher times. Our opening song, Zoom Gali Gali, it's known as the pioneer song, sung by young Israelis who worked the land and built the state of Israel. Well, we have on the program with us today, an American pioneer who built reform Judaism into what it is today, a wise person in more than just name. You know, wisdom does not necessarily belong to those who have the most knowledge, but rather to those who know how to use it in the most positive and effective way. And our guest today holds the distinction of being America's most influential rabbi of the 19th century, especially with regard to Congregation Micah. Some of his major pioneering achievements include establishing the Union of American Hebrew Congregations in 1873, now called the Union for Reform Judaism, and creating HUC, the Hebrew Union College in 1875, which ordains rabbis, invests cantors, and now offers a variety of other educational and academic programs. A World War II liberty ship was even named in his honor. Please welcome to Ancient Secrets, Rabbi Isaac Mayer Wise. Come gather around people wherever you roam and admit that the waters around you have grown for the time they are exchanged. Rabbi Wise, what a true honor to have someone on the program without which, well, Rabbi Lori and I, so many other reform rabbis, we could just not do what we do if you did not did what, have done if you, what you did, creating the whole infrastructure in America for Jews who no longer saw the Torah as been, being written by God. Congregation Micah and its inclusive approach really exists because of you. Rabbi Flip, thank you for having me. I did what I did so that you can do what you do. And I did it for the people you serve, especially at Congregation Micah, which holds a very special place in my heart. Thank you. What, what was the inspiration to create these institutions, which, while certainly struggling during the result of this pandemic and its economic impact, are really the pillars on which Reform Judaism have stood now for generations? Well, we still have to wait and see if our progressive Judaism will even survive into the future, but I think it can and it will, even given the correct challenges that it faces. Let's back up a bit. Learn about your beginnings. You were born in 1819 in what was known as Bohemia or part of the former Czech Republic, and I was taught that you were a brilliant student, that by the age of nine, your father, Leo, a teacher himself, had taught you all he knew about the Bible and the Talmud. So you went to study with your grandfather who was actually a physician. You studied formally at the University of Prague and the University of Vienna. And at the age of 23 in 1842, you appeared before a Beit Din, a rabbinical court that ordained you as a rabbi. Yes, that is all correct. But as far as my education is concerned, and by the way, I got my PhD on the ship coming from Germany to America. But a man is also defined by his relationships. And shortly after I became ordained, I married. Teresa and I had 10 children, but being a rabbi in Bohemia was fraught with problems. There was governmental restrictions that were still in force against the Jews. And America's promise of religious freedom brought me to New York in July of 1846. Ah, you changed your names to Wise, right? From its uh, original German spelling, Weiss, I think it was. Well, it was a way to be more American and, and still be Jewish. Even the Talmud teaches that we must follow the laws of the land in which we Jews live. Could you maybe talk a little bit about your pulpit life being a rabbi in the United States? 
It's the classic rabbi synagogue tale. First, I became a rabbi at Congregation Bethel in Albany, New York, and there was the honeymoon period. And then we began reforming the traditions. It was a splendid time to test the waters, and the newly initiated reforms in religious worship, worship laid the foundation for what was to become the reform movement. We started a choir with men and women sitting together in the pews. No surprise. Soon, however, the changes resulted in disapproval by some of the board. In 1850, on Rosh Hashanah, you should believe it, I was dismissed at a rump meeting of the board of directors. And the next day, havoc broke loose between those who wanted all those reforms that I was introducing and those who opposed them. And not unlike that Micah miracle so special, a group broke away from the congregation so that, so that it could explore its creativity while honoring those great traditions. And together, we established a new reform temple. And how long did you stay in New York? By 1854, I was hired away to go to Cincinnati, the queen city of the country, having accepted a position to become the rabbi of KK B'nai Yeshurun, another early reform temple, and not just hired, but I told them, Rabbi Flip, that if I didn't get life tenure before I got there, I was not leaving. And unbelievably, that congregation gave me life tenure and I served there for the rest of my life. We should all be lucky that uh, they were able to take that chance on you. Uh, you, know, you should know that I think since 1931, that temple has actually been known as the Isaac Mayer Wise Temple. <laughs> yes, it is a very special thing that uh, that's been flattering to me. And I served the community, as I said, until I passed away in 1900. And while I was there, I recognized that the reform movement needed to be more than just a congregation or just a few congregations. It needed to be an organization of a lot of congregations, even though it was a very difficult task. And I was always at odds with the traditional and orthodox rabbis, even though it had been my attempt to unite Jews into one organization for all Jews, not to separate and divide us. But nevertheless, despite those setbacks, I continued to advocate for a union of congregations, one common prayer book, and especially, most important to me, a college to educate and train American rabbis. Well, it may seem to some that you failed in some of your efforts to unite American Jews of all persuasions, but you did bring about great unanimity among Reform Jews. And you succeeded in adapting Reform Judaism to American life. Plus, part of your dreams came true in 1873, when those 34 Reform congregations sent delegates to meet in Cincinnati. That's when the Union of American Hebrew Congregations was born. And then only two years later, in July of 1875, the Union established the Hebrew Union College, the first Jewish seminary in the United States. Almost like George Washington, you proved to be an astute politician who propagandized tirelessly for centralized reform institutions. So you were the obvious candidate to become the seminary's first president. Well, you know, I started the Union of American Hebrew Congregations, and look at the name, expressly to gather the congregations together to start a rabbinical school. And it became, as you said, the Hebrew Union College, a rabbinical seminary for all Jews of all denominations. And I did see that through the efforts of all the planning and organization that I had been doing, uh, and that this confederation of synagogues, which was primarily Midwest and Southern congregations, grew into that association uh, of American and Canadian reform congregations. And I'm proud to have helped organize the most important accomplishment physically of my career, and that was the design and then the building of the Plum Street Temple in 1866. And as you know, the architecture of that building is just remarkable. Yes, it is quite beautiful. So maybe skip a little bit of humility and tell us how big a role you played defending Judaism against the inroads of Christianity while refusing to demonize it. 
I mean, your views of the founding figures of Christianity were innovative. They were influential. You were among the earliest Jewish scholars to reclaim Jesus as a Jew. And more controversially, you even suggested Paul was in fact the Talmudic figure, Acher. Now, Rabbi Flip, I, I only did what I did and said what I said and wrote what I wrote in an effort to bolster the pride of my fellow Reformed Jews and sit at the table with those interfaith partners because Jewish-Christian relations were vital then, just as all faith traditions united are vital now. And I'm a true believer in the universal mission of Judaism. And to do that, I created the very first Jewish newspaper in America called the American Israelite. In fact, I had two of them. I had a German language one and an English language one. And the English language one is still published today in Cincinnati, where I was the first publisher, the first owner, the first editor, and it still exists as we speak today. A lot of firsts. So let's talk about the first time that those rabbis were ordained in Cincinnati. I mean, could you comment on the Trefa banquet? Like, did it really happen? Did you really serve non-kosher food at the dinner celebrating the first ordination of American rabbis? <laughs> Well, it wasn't exactly one of my best catering efforts, I guess you would say. Um, and I wasn't exactly responsible for the food that was served. But th the truth of the matter was the caterer, who was a friend of mine, in fact, somehow we were related. And he said, you know, Rabbi Wise, I'm going to throw in a few extra goodies to the menu that we'd already determined. And uh, he printed this menu. It was beautiful with little fabric fringe all around it and in French and in English, and it had a few things on there that did rile the feathers of my Orthodox colleagues like um, scallops and shrimp and uh, a few other things that probably would have been kosher no-nos. Yeah, Kitchen Judaism, I think it was called, and it did yeah. s spur the splitting off of another movement, you know, conservative Judaism. Well, I appreciate that uh, Judaism is not just about who we are inside, it is what we are inside, but not just about what we are outside and put inside. And who knows, given the stresses of the pandemic of these crazy days, there are a lot of folks who are still talking about a post-denominational Judaism. But no one knows what that would look like. Organizations, institutions, it's how we get things done. And I hope there will always be the denomination of Reformed Judaism because as you know so well in everything that you and your talented wife do at Congregation Micah, it isn't reformed Judaism, it's reform Judaism, a name that we thought about for a very long time to show progress and change, not just something that was done and it was over. Yeah, well, thank you. I, I believe that too. There is a constant reforming of the tradition, but you seem to have a real need to standardize everything. Well, you know, I wanted for the Jews of America to have one book that we would all be praying from, one language we'd all understand. And by the way, it didn't work out so well, even at the beginning. I wrote a prayer book. One of my colleagues who was a competitor wrote another prayer book. And I thought, for sure, my congregational association, the Union of Hebrew Congregations, American Hebrew Congregations, they would pick the prayer book I wrote. But guess what? Even though I was the founder and the president of that organization, they picked the prayer book of my competitor. And that became the union prayer book. That became the prayer book for all of Reform Judaism for just about um, 50 years, almost 60 years. There were a couple of places who still used mine called Minhag America, the tradition, the customs of America. But everybody else was using the Union Prayer Book. So he got one point, I got no points. Well, we know that some of its poetry still resonates, that's for sure. Let me ask, um, you really are the, the quintessential Reformed Jew. I mean, a pioneer. You are among the first, as we mentioned, also uh, to suggest that women be counted in forming a minion, a religious quorum. I mean, you invented confirmation, which you opened to girls as well. And you hourly stated that you did not believe in the coming of the Messiah or the resurrection of the dead. I mean, I can see why some Orthodox Jews might take issue with you. Miracles, dogmas, doctrines, this is not what Judaism is about. 
Reform Judaism emphasizes evolution, the changing nature of our faith and the superiority of our ethics. Now, revelation is ongoing, and it has to be examined closely with, with the human reason and intellect, not centered on ancient traditions of Mount Sinai. And I am so proud that Reformed Judaism has grown into such an inclusive and accepting movement as evidenced by your temple. Well, um, that's some true wisdom. Thank you for that. And thank you for really being part of our history and part of our present by joining us today. Please give Rabbi Lori and all those wonderful people at Congregation Micah my very best. We'll stick around just for a moment and then we'll find out who you really are and what you've been doing lately. But first, a word from our sponsor. It's is brought to you by Congregation Micah, a vibrant synagogue serving all of Middle Tennessee, offering creative and diverse ways to celebrate Jewish life using the rich beliefs and practices of progressive Judaism as its foundation. It's time to reveal the hero behind our hero. Rabbi Kenneth Cantor served for many years as the Associate Dean and Director of Rabbinical Program on the Cincinnati campus of HUC. But he's also the founding rabbi of our community, Congregation Micah, which he birthed and raised till her bat mitzvah. Originally from Chicago, Rabbi Cantor received uh, his BA in Jewish and American History from Harvard University, was ordained from HUC and awarded an honorary Doctor of Divinity. He served for 10 years as rabbi of Chattanooga's Mitzvah Congregation, as an assistant over at the Temple here in Nashville, and as a Jewish chaplain and adjunct professor at Vanderbilt University. He still lectures, he writes, he mentors, and loves uh, American popular, uh, Jewish contributions to American popular music. His late wife, Wendy, is still held dear by many of our members. And now Rabbi Cantor is married to Dr. Tony Cantor. And they have three children, two grandchildren. And uh, most importantly, I consider Ken a personal friend a longtime mentor who um, has a whole new organization that he wants to tell us about. Ken, thank you so much for your willingness to be playful with us, to teach us, to join us. Uh, tell us uh, how you've been doing, you and Tony, especially during this pandemic, and if you got any really good advice for us. Well, the first thing, Flip, is I love the fact that you're doing this. I've been watching these, uh, these programs that you've done, and uh, it's Interesting to go from Rashi and Maimonides and all these other great scholars all the way to Isamir Wise, who would love that to be included in that group, I have to say. Um, and I love where Micah has gone and watching your services and the beautiful music that Lisa and Jerry and Michael Oakes, all these people have uh, continued to do uh, in that Micah miracle that you referred to early on. Uh, it's been a challenge, the pandemic, needless to say, but I will tell you that on Friday nights, I get to watch like five or six Shabbat services each week. So I check in and what you're doing and you're in Central Time. And then I watch my other students who are in Eastern Time and some who are in uh, Pacific Time. So I get a whole bunch of a kind of a viewpoint of what's going on in, in Judaism around our world on, on Shabbat during this pandemic. Uh, HUC where my office is, is closed. And so I'm working from home. And no, I don't wear a tie every time I get up in the morning, but I do kind of pretty much dress in everything but the tie, and maybe the jacket, just so it feels like I'm actually working. Um, and you're nice enough to ask of what I went to do and what I've been doing now. Well, for uh, 14 years, 13 years, I was the associate dean and director of the rabbinical school in Cincinnati. Uh, and then I had the opportunity uh, after some administrative changes in Cincinnati with my colleagues on all the campuses, um, to be invited to become the rabbinical director of this organization called, then called the Society for Classical Reform Judaism, now called the Roots of Reform Judaism. And I'll tell you why I took the job. I wanted to try to do for other congregations what we had succeeded in doing in Nashville with Congregation Micah. I wanted to emphasize the welcome of all different peoples into congregational life uh, in using language that was accessible for people, of liturgy that was familiar, but at the same time uplifting and inspiring, of music that was a tribute to the 19th and 20th century of the great composers of those days, as well as the Michael Oakes's and the, and the Lisa Silvers and uh, the Debbie Friedman's and others of our day. And, and that's what the Roots of Reform Judaism uh, has set out to create. And so amongst the things that we've been doing, and so grateful to you and Lori 
uh, Scott O'Neill, much beloved member of the MICA family, is, uh, works with us and, and uh, we're so grateful for that. Um, we're being able to take these prayers and liturgy, some of which came from the Union Prayer Book. They needed to be modernized and it needed to be kind of uh, inclusive, which some of them weren't in the 1890s. Uh, and we've been creating a series of prayer books, little booklets, like 24 pages, that people can have at home. And we're gearing it especially to people who can't get to synagogue, not because the services are online, but because they're elderly or frail or uh, our shut-ins, uh, and we've created now nine little, actually eight little booklets, soon to be nine, of High Holiday, of uh, Passover, Shabbat, one for the military. Did you know there's no prayer book for reform rabbis in the military? The only one that's been put out is for the Orthodox, so we've been working on that with uh, some uh, chaplains, HUC alumni chaplains. So, I mean, we're doing a lot of really important things, and we put out our first Shabbat service. It's not as fancy as you and Laurie do, uh, and it's certainly not as elegant a place when you look at the background and see uh, the beautiful sanctuary at, at Micah. But it was really fun to do, and we're now going to have a Rosh Hashanah and a Yom Kippur service. Now, don't tell anybody, Flip, but our whole Rosh Hashanah service, one hour long. No morning and evening. One service, one hour. And Yom Kippur, we're combining Kol Nidre, and Morning, and Yisker, and Neila, one hour and 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> We're actually hoping, in fact, that uh, with the prayer books that we've now written and that will be made available, that um, people can use these worship services at home, and whether it's a person who's not a member of a congregation uh, or who just wants that experience, that they'll be able to serve a, another part of our Reformed community. And I should mention that these booklets and the prayers that we're using are being used with the permission of and the support of the URJ and the CCAR. So it's, we're, we're well within the family of uh, Reformed Judaism. Well, let me back up and say a couple of things. One, you know, you were just so kind uh, uh, to Lori and I when we arrived and we've been able to develop such a nice relationship. And it, it made so much sense to me when you became uh, one of the deans at, at the college because of that warmth. Because I remember the deans when I was in school and I was just learning to be a rabbi and to have mentors and people be able to pull you aside and offer you the right kind of feedback in the, in the gentle, most gentle possible way. I mean, I just, you seem so fitting for that role. Uh, and I, I've, I assume some rabbis, um, you know, put on a yarmulke and right off into the sunset, but here you are now taking on a new challenge. Uh, uh, and, um, I guess it's not surprising. One of the things that I know I try to do when I put a service together is to think of the different kinds of things people will be inspired by or will resonate to. And um, so like when I think of music, I remember there were certain categories we used to put music into, like there was music of majesty, where the cantor, Bates O'Neill, someone is just singing something so beautiful that you just, you listen. Uh, and that there was music of meeting, and this was a big sort of generational thing at camping. We just called it M, the meeting, because people were playing the guitar and you were meeting them face to face. And what I always find very powerful is music of memory, which is to say, if we pull that old Ose Shalom that, I don't know, Michael Oakes wrote in the, the early 2000s, or, or, or we go even further back, there's some tune to Sim Shalom or uh, uh, Peace, Thy Precious Gift. It works in English, too. It's not just about music. And so uh, it makes so much sense to me that the roots of Reform Judaism would be able to go in and tap into some of that memory and have it feel inspiring and having it feel familiar. Can you talk just a little bit too about how do we reach out and expose new people to it and have them resonate to that if they yeah. don't have memory of it? No, that's a super question. And you know, one of the things that we've been working on, and Bates has been a big part of this and will continue to be, is to create a resource center of great reform music. So that if people go to the website, which is rootsofreformjudaism.org, um, they can find and they'll continue to find because we're populating it with more and more music. This great music may be of your parents or grandparents. You're, you, know, you and Lori are both a, a generation younger than me, certainly, if not more. Um, and so what was the music of my young childhood was the music of your parents and grandparents. But uh, you know, there are some songs that you hear that if you're my age or, or uh, 
more of my experience, will instantly remind you of being at temple or synagogue with my family and you know what that emotion was like sitting next to my mom and dad or my grandparents and hearing a big beautiful choir singing beautiful music that was uplifting and inspiring and that's the music of memory and and i love hearing you talk about michael oaks writing that music oh a long time ago you know 2010 well that's when i was there and he was writing them with us together and one of the things that flip you'll know so well michael is so creative and he sits there and he's kind of noodling and doodling at the piano and especially when we used to do this consecration service for the confirmation class which was late at night and they're sitting in the sanctuary it's really special and michael was playing background music and lo and behold a month later that background music became a new ose shalom or became a new lachado di or became a new something else you just have to get the transcontinental music book that's michael oakes's collection of his music and say oh i remember that one oh i remember that one and and, and that's the, the mark of an extraordinary creator but that's new music i'm thinking about the music of max janowski whose name you should know because he's the one of Malkenu shemaha kolehinu or uh, Lewandowski or Zulzer or Steinberg. These are people who wrote from the 1880s, some of the earlier, Zulzer was earlier, all the way to the 1950s and 60s. That was the reform music of their day. And, and it's one of the things, you know, when, when Julie or, or Lisa or other people played the guitar, um, we realized that if it hadn't been for reform music, which introduced the organ, to synagogue music. We wouldn't have the guitars today because there was no, uh, once the, disc, the uh, temple was destroyed and from that point on, no more instrumentation till the 19th century and 18th century of early reform, 1802 to be precise. There were no musical instruments and reform said, let's bring that back and the mixed choir. I mean, there's, it, it's really a very special part to remember our heritage as we build on to the future. Uh, it makes me think I sort of wanted to share with you, which I was going to do offline, but we'll let them listen. Uh, I did a bris uh, last week, and um, well, I was officiated at the bris. And it was very appropriate. It was on a patio. It was just a family, and we were outside and, and socially distant. And um, when I left, I thought, I'm 50, year, 50 years older than that baby. That's a lot of years older. And then I thought, they're Micah people. Like, I'm, I'll, I'll probably officiate at the bar mitzvah of that, that young kid. And, um, and I thought, maybe I'll get to do his wedding because he'll want me to because by then, actually, I won't be the rabbi at Micah anymore. It'll be a long time from now, right? But he'll be the last that I do the full life cycle with. Babies born after this, I probably will not do a full life cycle with. And I mention that because um, nobody says this anymore. But for a long time in my career, they said, I'd show up and they go, you're the rabbi? You seem kind of young to be the rabbi. But nobody says that anymore. And in fact, I've moved to onto another phase. My phases, never, I never get to stay very long at them, would not have been possible without you and your trailblazing attitude. The same way I'm trying to expose people to these names, Akiva and, and Hillel, who were they? We stand on big shoulders, just like we stand on Rabbi Wise's shoulders. And you ha have very broad shoulders and should feel very blessed and lucky because there are many students serving uh, the Jewish people throughout this country that really would not have made it through and would not have, could not do what they do, uh, be innovative and share that warmth and that music and the memory and whatever if you didn't really do what you do. So it is not a surprise to me that you continue to do it. And um, I just want to thank you for it. And thank you for being a part of our community still. Well, let me just say that one of the great pleasures and gifts has been the friendship that you and Lori and I have had ever since you came. The congregation was very wise in picking both of you to lead them into the future. And at the same time, to keep some of the things that were part of that Mica miracle of uh, those beginning days all those years ago. It, it's really a gift to me that you're still doing it and built on and made it even better, way yeah, better. I've often said, this was a great community before we got here, we just didn't mess it up. And so um, <laughs> we thank you for creating uh, the really the principles of this place because uh, its culture remains and um, uh, it's a special place. And I hope you know it's your home too. And anytime you and Tony want to come do with us and, and join you. us on the pulpit, we'd love to have it. Yeah. Well, thank you for letting me part of, be part of this 
amazing series. I Absolutely. never thought uh, Isaac Mayer Wise and I would have anything in common uh, <laughs> except uh, representing him today. Well, I also wish you much success with Roots Reform Judaism. Know that Congregation Micah is your partner. And um, if people want to go and cheat on us a little bit and watch some of their high holidays, we only support it. People should do what they find inspiring and fulfilling. Well, you know, the good news is it's online. They can watch it any day they want. It doesn't have to be, God forbid, on uh, instead of what you and Lori and, and the <coughs> congregation are doing for Yontif. Well, Ken, we love you. We wish you uh, and your whole family the best, and we want you to stay safe. And uh, we just thank you for uh, being on the program today. Thanks, Cliff. Thank you very much. Zoom, 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 zoom.